Vic, I have to laugh a little bit because I remember the first time I talked with you on the telephone. I w we were asking you to go for a ministry to the country of I Lithuania. Remember, I remember, uh -huh. And I didn't know who you were, and I didn't know what you've done or where you've been, but I remember asking you, um, have you ever traveled overseas before? Do you know how to take care of your visa and, and all these little kind of preliminary things and ready to travel overseas? And you just kind of, you said something to me about uh, my age or something, it seems like. I can't remember. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, if I'd have gone into detail, Jeff, I would have told you that I have uh, two or three passports uh, that are already full. Uh -huh. And uh, I would have told you that I spent uh, eight and a half years of my life living overseas. And so, it, it, you know, it was like asking a, um, I don't know, asking a cow a, if they ever get milk or, or whatever. <clears throat> if they've had any experience yeah, in being overseas. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> but I forgave you for that. I forgave you. I just, I just sort of, uh, Well, I didn't know, know that you'd you traveled overseas, tongue. but w what kind of places have you been, anyhow? Do you know, <clears throat> I was um, 26 years old, mm -hmm. and I had three children, and uh, Betty, Betty, who's my wife, we were invited to She go was your wife? She still is, come oh, to think okay. of it. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> Betty and I, with our three children, um, we were invited to go to Pakistan. And, uh, and I didn't know Pakistan from any place. What year would this have been? Uh, this would have been 1966. I'm just trying to figure out how old you are. Okay. Uh, Pakistan in, in 1966. Well, I said I was 26, so I must have been born in 1940. You know, I don't know if you're good at math. Mm -hmm. But anyway, get the picture. Here, well, I'm thinking Pakistan in 1966. Well, I mean, that is it, incredible. It, well, that would have been an incredible experience. Well, it, it, it really was, although, although it was different than it is currently. Anyway, Betty and I, we wanted to be missionaries. And so we got this call to go to Pakistan. We didn't know Pakistan. It could have been any place. I think at first we thought we were going to Ethiopia. And I remember getting on a ship. It was the middle of winter. It was two days before Christmas. You took a ship to Pakistan? We took a ship. It was a freighter. Did they not have airplanes back in those days? Well, they did. But, you, but the whole idea was that if you accompanied your luggage, it was to, you, you had to pay less duty. I see. But I want to tell you. Okay. It was a month going over there in the middle of the winter. There was a storm on the Atlantic. It was so bad that it was in, in a, uh, it actually broke up things on the ship. And it, in t uh, two more points, and it would have been a hurricane or something. Uh, but what anyway, a way to start out an adventure, going on a missionary experience. Uh, it, uh, uh, one of the seamen said, I'm sure glad Christmas was over. I don't think I could have started it another day. I mean, that's how bad <laughs> the storm was. But anyway, I can't explain to you how, how I felt when we, when we uh, pulled into the uh, port of Karachi. And it was just overwhelming. I, I just, I think I had seen pictures of it, but I couldn't imagine such a thing. And I was just overwhelmed. It was like going to Disneyland, and, uh, and it was so exciting. But you know, that began to rub off after a while. In other words... You started to see it for what it really was. Well, well it, it was that, it was that I, I began to have culture shock. I mean, I had a full well, how about blown your wife? case. She, she, she was wanted, wonderful. She was wonderful. She I, wanted to pack up her bags and head home. I was the one. I actually wished that I could have a nervous breakdown so they'd put me in a basket <laughs> and I could go home honorably. See, I didn't want to go home as a quitter. I wanted to go home for medical reasons. <laughs> but I want to tell you, you know, a person doesn't know how much his culture is into the warp and woof of his very being until oh, you get absolutely. out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now, now, you travel around a little bit yourself. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Well, we've, I've been, like you, I'm on my second passport, and both mm -hmm. of them are full of visas <coughs> from all over the place. been way into the, the inside of China to Nepal and all over the world, basically, and European countries, Eastern European countries. So I've had an experience of, of having to deal with the food and the sanitation mm -hmm. and just <coughs> sometimes communicating with people and think you understand, but you don't. You know, you're speaking English, but they, they're processing. You know, like maybe some people have Macintosh processors and others have IBMs IBM, or something. That's right. That's yeah. right. But there's been a lot of times there's situations that come up, and I just have to scratch my head, and I, I say, Lord, I wonder how you sort this one out. Like being in India and sitting in a church in India, and the women are on one side and the men are on mm -hmm, the other mm -hmm. side, mm -hmm. and they're, pra they're praising God by singing their music, and we're sitting on these chairs that are only about this tall. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm sitting next to this pastor who works for our ministry. And they're, they're singing and they have their tambourines. And they're, mm -hmm. they're singing this high-pitched music that I couldn't even make my... <coughs> it's on the black notes, too, by the way. Is that how it... it <laughs> have you ever noticed that the thing that, at least in India, they play is called a harmonium? It's a little bit like an accordion, but that they just pump sets. It. And, and it's being pumped with one hand and being played with another. I asked this pastor, I said what is this anyhow? I said, I, th this, this is really strange to me. And he just laughed and he said, Jeff, this is how we've been doing church ever since it started here. <laughs>
but it was culture shock for me. Of course. Uh, now, I don't know uh, uh, when you speak of, of, of the music, of course, you know, in, in many countries they dress different. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how have you, through the uh, years in your travels, accustomed uh, yourself to different kinds of food? <laughs> Actually, I've accustomed myself to different kinds of food very well, except for in one place, and that was inside China. Uh -huh. After about uh, two weeks inside China, and going to the open markets and seeing them getting lizards mm -hmm. and having snakes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. ducks that were cooked with their heads on mm -hmm. that were hanging up in the marketplaces, mm -hmm. and I was so happy to get on the airplane in Shanghai and be heading home. But I remember once when I was in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that's a rice region. And, uh, and we're talking about, you know, these people who eat rice, if they don't have rice every day, they begin to really feel uncomfortable. In fact, if they don't have rice three times a day, they feel really <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> but, but, but I could laugh at that because, mm -hmm. because I'm a potato man. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, and so I can have rice and appreciate rice, but if I don't get a potato thrown in now and then, I begin <laughs> to feel about, about like they would with rice. Have you noticed... You're really saying that there's cultural differences. There's there. cultural differences. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you were mentioning the fact that there are churches where the men and the women sit on different sides. And by the way, sitting on the floor. Oh, yes, I've seen it many times. Have you seen the cultures that seem to live on the floor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Southeast Asia is mm -hmm. really common. It's on the floor, and so, and so where we want to sit down, I can remember when we were visiting, they would bring a chair for us to sit in, and they would sit on the floor. I know when I sit on the floor too long, I get sore. But, uh, you know, it kind of stretches your legs. Uh -huh. I noticed when I was over there that, that we're, uh, where we we'll tend sometimes to take off our, our, our hats when, uh, when we go to church. There are other places where they'll cover their heads. Mm -hmm. uh, we would put on our shoes to go to church. They'll take their shoes off. Mm -hmm. uh, so many cultural differences. It's amazing. I'm kind of glad that we're not all the same culture. Yeah. It makes it very, very interesting. Well, some of the places, they're, they're pretty protective of their culture, too. Like in the Philippines, when we have a workers' meeting, um, we tried to only have rice for just one meal, and then we tried to have some other types of vegetables and things, mm -hmm. and that lasted for one day, and then there was anarchy in the camp, because the Filipinos said, it's part of our culture that we have to have rice with every meal. And they were really insistent upon it. And I mean, they said that they, they emphasized, this is our culture, you know. Oh, sure, And they sure. didn't like the idea of us imposing the fact that we were going to do it our way. They wanted to do it their way because that's what oh, they were used course. to. And I think we need to be respectful of culture. Absolutely. Yeah. We need to be respectful. Things mm -hmm. are different. I don't know if when you married your wife that you, uh, you uh, recognized that you were marrying a, a little different culture, even in this country. Yeah, there's uh, every it's, family. It's a female culture. Every, what, no, every <laughs> family is its own culture, isn't it? Families mm -hmm. do things differently than other families, and maybe even parts of the country mm -hmm. here in the United States. You know, the South does things just a little bit different than the Northeast. Mm -hmm. uh, the West is going to do things just a little bit different. Culture is part of human existence. Mm -hmm. I think it needs to be recognized. Now, it seems as if that there's getting to be kind of a universal culture. Why do you think that is? I have my own, my own thoughts on that, but what do you think? Well, what would one of your thoughts be? I mean, uh, I, television. Television is, television is becoming a universal language, especially with satellite downlinks coming into mm -hmm. all the different countries. For instance, India has a historic culture of wearing a sari, that's a female yes, dress. Yes, yes. Men oftentimes wearing a towel wrapped around, you know, mm -hmm. as, a, as a type of a dress and a long shirt. And now you're starting to see that the young Indian girls, especially of the higher caste, are starting to wear blue jeans yes, and right. the, the, the typical teenage belly button shirt and right, right. with the earrings and, and makeup. And they look just like they came from America, basically. There's getting to be a, 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 almost a universal uh, uh, way of dressing, and, and you're absolutely right. You're it, telling it, me something about in China for years under Chairman Mao. There was a, a type of dress I, well, code. Well, I, I think it was called the Mao uniform. I don't, you remember it was kind of green colored. It didn't have a collar. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, now I haven't been to, Ch I, I've been to uh, Hong Kong and, uh, and to Taiwan, but uh, the pictures I'm seeing coming out of China these days is showing more and more of their inhabitants dressed in what we would call the, uh, the Western dress. Mm -hmm. The Western dress is almost becoming the universal dress. Especially All, for business people. For, 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 uh, for business people. Mm -hmm. You know, there are... Uh, uh, things to be learned from other cultures. Do you know, uh, so much of a culture has to do with, with two things. One is its, its language, uh, mm -hmm. and another is its, its religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's pretty hard to separate a culture from its language and religion. I, now, when we speak of, uh, of India, and by the way, I like India food. I love India. I, like, I love I, Indian I, food. I, it, you know, mm -hmm. there's no place like India to me. There's no place quite like it. 
we talk about the Indian culture. The Indian culture is many cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody told me that there's something like 250 languages and dialects. It's close to that in dialects. Mm -hmm. So over in that part of the world, your, your name huh, sh shows what religion you are, how you, how, how you dress. For example, the Sikhs. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen these Sikhs? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, he has his turban. Honest. I don't know if you've ever noticed that they have these bangles on their arms. No, I've never noticed mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. uh, and somebody said that they have um, that they have a sword someplace on them. Now, or, originally, it might have been a real sword. It might be just a little sort of an ornamental sword. Now, so it's interesting that a culture a culture affects everything about you. It affects your name, your language, the way you dress, and even the food you eat. Yeah, and sometimes it can present a challenge when you start working in these different countries. Because I know like when we went to the Philippines, we started working with indi indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. these people were animus. And for our viewers, that basically meant that they worship snakes and birds mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and things of nature. And we started working with this really primitive people group. And we started sharing with them that when someone in the village would die, when they buried their body, they should bury their body probably at least three to four feet down under the ground. Right. But they, they wouldn't do that because they felt that if they bury, if they dug a hole that was only two feet deep or any deeper than that, spirits, evil spirits would come up out of the ground. Interesting. So they would bury the bodies only like about two feet and then these wild pigs or wild boars would come and they'd be rooting around and then they would eat those those uh, oh, people's bodies that were buried. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then some of the village people would be shooting the pigs and eating the pigs. Mm, mm. And it's such a wonderful blessing to see the changes that started taking place by teaching these animist people to overcome their superstitions right. and to be able to have what we call comfort rooms, which we, right, we would refer right. to as a bathroom. Right, right. That was a big obstacle. You know, the whole idea of digging a hole and using it as like a, a little portable septic system for right, them for right. their, their comfort room uh, was a scary thing at first. But slowly we started seeing the gospel, you know, soften them and changed their ideologies and uh, we didn't upset their culture but what we were doing was starting to help them to understand that there was a better way of living. Well now some might say that that you were upsetting their culture uh -huh. in other words if if all the details of their culture are you know we're going to keep intact you know there are some that are even saying uh, Jeff that we ought as when we when we go out to carry the gospel that we ought to carry the gospel but not our culture and, and there's debates on that. Big <clears throat> debates, yeah. Well, and now, now I'm going to take a point of view, and, and others may not agree with me. Why don't you hold that thought for a second? Okay. Okay, because we need to take a break. You're watching Layman Ministries Crosstalk, and we'll be back in just a moment. If you would like to receive copies of our exciting mission videos where we take you into each country so you can experience the culture, travel, and challenges of missionaries, or if you would like a free copy of our magazine, Layman Ministry News, with exciting mission stories from around the world and theological articles written with the layman in mind, write or call Layman Ministries, 414 Zapata Road, St. Mary's, Idaho, 83861, 1-800-245-1844. Layman Ministries Bookstore carries hundreds of books, Bibles, resource materials, videotapes, and audio tapes, all at discounted prices. To receive your free catalog, write or call Layman Ministries, 414 Zapata Road, St. Mary's, Idaho, 83861, or call 1-800-245-1844. You can also visit us online at www.lmn.org and make sure to check out the links to our catalog and magazines. Well, Dick, you were just sharing with us that there's a big debate taking place about whether or not missionaries should take their culture into these other third world countries. What were you going to say about that? Well, well, you know, not everybody sees eye to eye. Some are saying that the Western missionaries, let's say the people from America and from Europe, that that they 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 took more than their the, the gospel they took their culture and of course i don't know what they mean by that now 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 let me flesh out uh, where i'm coming from supposing that we go to a to a region huh, where the people are filthy the 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 disease huh, they're illiterate huh, uh, or even we, uh, we spoke about india before the break and we were talking about the fact that the that the you know the 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 many customs hinduism was big there i mean it's the it's, it's the it's majority the predominant. 
religion. But you know, when the British arrived there, there was a custom that said that, that if the husband died before the wife, they would have the big beer to, to cremate him, and mm -hmm. the wife was supposed to jump on top of that. Or they'd sometimes tie her up huh? by force it, and put it, her on It top. was called mm -hmm. sati. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, the Westerners said, that's illegal. Now, now some could say, well, you know, we were raiding their culture. Well, I, yes, indeed we were. Yes, indeed we but were. Praise God we were. Praise God. <laughs> because there are cultures that, are, that, uh, that treat women really bad, mm -hmm. that treat women bad. They have disease. They have uh, uh, illiteracy. And, 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 and in fact, some of them are even in prison to spirits. You were mentioning these indigenous tribes in the yes, Philippines. Yes. Now, the question that we're going to ask is simply this. If we're going to say that, that we're going to take the gospel to these countries, but that we shouldn't affect their culture, I have problems with that. You see, I believe that my culture is the way I live. I, I, well, wait a second. What you're saying is the culture the way you live? Or are you saying... It's the way anybody lives. Now, anybody lives. I think His maybe there's a... He lives. Let, me, let me see if I can clarify this, and you can agree with me or not agree with me, but what you're saying is, is that there's your culture, there's my culture, and then there's the biblical culture, or God's culture, is what you're saying. Well, the, and so that I hadn't said that. that you haven't I said hadn't, that? I hadn't said that yet. I okay. simply said that I can't separate culture from the way I live. And then what you ah, just said catches in. Okay. In other words, when really the question is, when the gospel goes to a place, will it affect the way I live? Absolutely. Will it, then will it affect my culture? The answer has to be yes. Yeah. In other words, can I take the gospel to a place without affecting the culture? I say no. In our culture, let's, let's keep it right here in the United States. We see a, a guy in the gutter who's an alcoholic. We go over to him and throw a New Testament on his, on his lap or right, right. on his chest and say, here, read, read this, be ye saved, brother, and we just walk away and just leave him laying in the gutter. We've done nothing for him because the Word of God is going to take that man, pick him up, clean him off, and make a new creature out of him. Well, and, and what you're also suggesting is that an alcoholic is his culture. Yeah. I mean, that's who he is. And so <laughs> or a dope it, smoker or a druggie. Exactly. And you know, they it's are a subculture. subcultures. They're, They're called subcultures. subcultures. Mm -hmm. What parts of the culture will the gospel impact and what parts will it not impact? You know, I can't tell you the joy of going to a country uh, and, and, and changing the culture as it would relate, say, to sanitation. Mm -hmm. huh? you, know, it, you know, if an Well, just a good example is in the Philippines. When we used to go in these villages, people were defecating everywhere. They were sleeping with the pigs, the chickens, and the dog. Uh, the, the dog would have lice and fleas. The children would have parasites. They'd have skin infections. And to go to those villages now and see these children oh, clean. Yeah. Yeah. reading and writing in English and Tagalog, and have a sparkle in their eye, and uh, to see the big extended bellies with the parasites gone. That's right. I mean, to me, it's just, it's, it's overwhelming to see what Christ in God has done in these places to change people. And yeah. some people would say, yeah, you've up upset their culture. Absolutely, but, we've upset their culture. But for the best. This is just off to one side, but it's illustrating the point that we're making. Mm -hmm. If an angel were to come down from heaven and to say, you know, Jeff, uh, God wants uh, you to just have two rooms in your house from, from here on out. You can have only two rooms. What will it be? <clears throat> Take the bathroom and the kitchen. There you go. <laughs> Not, because we're talking about sanitation and nutrition. The things that, that af affect our life more than anything else, our physical life, mm -hmm. is our sanitation. Mm -hmm. huh? Do you know that um, over in these countries where I used to work, a child has only a 50-50 chance in some countries of reaching the age of five. Well, in the villages, like I was just mentioning in the Philippines, the children have a very high rate of death, especially in the unentered villages. Mm -hmm. And when the child dies on the parent's face, there's no emotion shown because death is such a common a occurrence common uh -huh. that there's no emotion involved. And so I guess, I guess what I'm saying is I just don't know how we can take the gospel without affecting the way well, people live. What I hear you saying is, is that you know, there's our culture, there's their culture, and then there's God's culture. And God's culture is built on certain premises. And that premises would be like God's commandments. Absolutely. For instance, if you know there's people in some places in Africa where they're involved with immorality as part of their ancestral worship, mm -hmm. or when somebody mm -hmm. dies, mm -hmm. that the, 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 the brother of the person who died has to have sex with the exactly. wife. Exactly. So that his brother's spirit can be released exactly. to go into the exactly. never-never land. Exactly. That God's Ten Commandments steps in as part of God's culture and says this changes in a, in a Christian life. The other thing is really complicated. This is just deviating just for a second, but it's an interesting story. Like when we were working in Romania, we had a, a worker there. He spoke English very well, and he was interfacing between our ministry and the government. And he was a better evangelist than he was 
a negotiator with the mm -hmm, government, mm -hmm. and he was making some mistakes. So we sat down with him very kindly and said, you know, you need to improve in this area and that area. And we talked with him, and then we left the country. One of the church leaders emailed me and said, why did you fire him? And I said, what? I emailed back, what are you talking about? We didn't fire him. We told him, you know, he needed to improve in a few areas. And they said, well, in our culture, when an employer sits down and says, we're not happy with your performance, it's basically a kind way of saying, we don't want you to work for us Okay, anymore. okay. So those are the kind of little things that can happen. These are the nuances, and I think we ought to respect those nuances. You, you see, this is not really we about the Ten Commandments. We have to learn them the hard way sometimes. We, well, sometimes we do. <laughs> and, 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 you see, this is the thing I think... I don't think that this is a, a, a win-lose uh, issue that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. In other words, if, per, if people say we shouldn't change the culture, I can understand where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to carry this to the extreme because of the, of the things that we've just said. Mm -hmm. I think a good example of that is what we're seeing here in America is where people are starting to, and I think it's good that people recognize their nationality. Maybe, see, America is a melting pot. We have Asians, we have people from all different countries here, you know, they're Latino and, and Caucasian and different people, European descent, African descent, and they want to celebrate their nationality. Right. Some of the, maybe some of the, the Irish, like St. Patrick's Day, for instance. Right, right. But um, when we start, we start um, emphasizing those things to the point where it starts causing division or separation or disunity, then we have a problem. Well, see, develop. this is why I use the illustration. I, I, I have a sermon I preach called, Can We Find Unity in Diversity? Mm -hmm. And I answer that right off the bat. By the way, that's the title of this program today. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's, you know, for shock effect, I'll start out and I'll say, Can we find a unity in diversity? And I'll right off the bat say no. And then I use my wife. Uh, and myself as an illustration, I say, here I'm married to this woman for more than 40 years. She likes rice, I like potatoes. I said, there's no way that we can ever get together on that. You can't convince her I to like potatoes? I can't convince her. In, in, in fact, it would break up our home. <laughs> and, and I guess what I'm saying is, is that though we're diverse, we're different with rice and potatoes, that we don't talk about it. In other words, we've been married for 40 years, huh? not in our diversity, but in spite of our diversity. Yeah, well, in other words, we, we've ignored our diversity because if we had, if we had just debated that diversity, or, uh, in other words, our unity is in spite of diversity. This is, why, end, this is why I have problems when people say, let's celebrate our differences. Yeah. I say, listen, let's respect our differences, Let's protect our differences, but let's not celebrate them because if you and I get together and talk all day long about how we're different, at the end of the day, we're we feel separated. Separated. That's why it says in Ephesians 4, 3, it says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. That's such a wonderful verse dealing with that subject. This is where this, uh, this issue, coming back to the church, mm -hmm. now the church is trying to be sensitive. It's trying to be sensitive to the differences in the church. Now, obviously, racism has no place in the church, yet we have different races in the church. So therefore, we're going to acknowledge them, we're going to respect them, and we're going to protect them. But the issue that, that comes to my mind is, is then shall we configure a church for differences or shall we configure a church for the things we have in common? Mm -hmm. Because, see, after some of the racial uh, challenges that we've had and we've tried to address, we have then the, the, uh, the, the gender issues. Gender issues. But between the male and the female. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, another one has been stacked on that, and that's the generational differences. Yes. M mentioning this generational thing, I got mm -hmm. a call from a, um, a man who must have been an elderly fellow and had been the, uh, the elder of his church for many years. And so he said, you know, Dick, he said, you know, I've been the elder of my church for many years. He says, I think I'll resign and give it to, give it to the young people. <laughs> and of course, you would expect me with my white hair to say this. I said, don't resign. Uh, the church needs you. But bring yeah. the young people on board. Mm -hmm. You see, I don't think... I think the devil, what he's trying to do is to divide us divide and then us. put us into a power struggle. Mm -hmm. Because once you divide mm -hmm. us up, then the question is, who rules? Mm -hmm. And so if we could just see this thing as a family, we, you know, the scripture calls it a body. Mm -hmm. It says the body has hands. Mm -hmm. uh, it has arms, legs, and shoulders, and it has eyes. Of course, this is the thing, this last thing that's so clear in scripture, Jesus is the head. Amen. What do I have in common with a believer in China? It's definitely mm -hmm. not chop suey. It's just like it says in Ephesians chapter 4. And it says, And we henceforth are no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby we lie wait and to deceive, but speaking the truth in love that we may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. We could throw in here, tossed to and fro by our culture. 
by our culture. Yeah. In other words, in other words, we have become sensitive to cultures. There's no doubt about that, and we should have. But we cannot let our culture, cultural differences, divide us. Again, I repeat: respect them, huh? protect them, acknowledge them, but don't celebrate them. In other words, we when you say celebrate them, clarify that because I know some churches celebrate like it means means accentuate it. it. It means bring it to the fore. Because I know some churches, what they do is they have a mixed congregation of Asians and different people, and they have a Sabbath where they get together and the fellowship meals, oh, no, all Asian I don't food. have any problem with so that. So when you just clarify the word I, celebrate. I don't have any problem, be, because if, uh, but, but I will say this, if, mm -hmm. if, if every Sabbath we have something that separate, that accentuates our differences, I don't think that that's gonna have a happy ending. Mm -hmm. Do it once in a while to, to affirm and to acknowledge, but we ought to not be doing, it, as a church, more and more things to divide us, to divide us mm -hmm. but more and more things that bring us into the unity of the faith. Mm -hmm. We ought to see the, the, the family of God as made up of many races, of yes. many cultures, of the genders, and of the generations. One of the things that I've always really disliked ever since I was a kid is um, discrimination. And that's a big word we hear a lot of today. And when I was a kid, I grew up in a part of America where there was very few people of other races. It was mm -hmm. predominantly Caucasian right. races there. And my parents, um, had a, a black family who worked at the university. They came and they stayed with us. We flew out to West Virginia and stayed with them. And so as a child, I became very accustomed, even though we lived in a predominant Caucasian right, area, right, right. to learn and respect and love people from other cultures. Mm -hmm. And to me, when I am around people who say bigoted or unkind things about people from other races, as a, an example, it just really sets wrong with me. Right. And when I start seeing this, even in the cultural issues, whether it's size or whether it's race, whatever or, it is, or whether it's uh, um, traditions from their different cultures, and they use those as a, a divisive tool, it's only going to just destroy the body of Christ and not really bring us into the unity of faith that Christ wants us to have. And I think that that's what we want this program to say. We want this program to say that that let's not let our sensitivity. Huh, to respecting each other's differences, mm -hmm. overthrow our unity, which Amen. is in Christ. That, that really the strength of the church is not its differences, but what it has in common, and that commonness is Jesus. Amen. That's why it says in Psalms 133, verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. In unity. Amen. You've been watching Layman Ministries Crosstalk. If you'd like to be part of this ministry, if you'd like to contact us in any way, you can do so at Layman Ministries. That's 414 Zapata Road, St. Mary's, Idaho, 83861. Or you can call us at our toll-free number. That's 1-800-245-1844. Or visit us on the web at www.lmn.org. Please check out Pastor Richard O'Phil's website at www.revivalsermons.org.